night, the last night, and uh, hope you can make it out. Some of you got perfect attendance so far. That's awesome. I hear Pastor Luke's got a gold star for all those that have been here each night, and so you'll want to make sure you collect on that. Um, but uh, yeah, man, that's good to be here. Glad you're here and uh, excited about what the Lord's going to do tonight. Let's take our Bible. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 15 tonight. Luke chapter number 15. We'll start in verse number 1. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 15, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, So Jesus is hosting a dinner party, and four groups of people have been invited to the party. The publicans, the sinners, the Pharisees, and the scribes. And the first two groups couldn't be any more different than the second two groups. And they have all been invited to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Now, the, the publicans, they were like the tax collectors of the day. They were the uh, uh, IRS, if you want to think of them that way. But uh, they, 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 that really doesn't quite paint the full picture. These were Jewish citizens who had gone to work for Rome. And so Rome was the oppressor. Rome was the enemy. And so they had really basically sold themselves to work for the Roman Empire. And with that, uh, lined their pockets with the Rome's money, but also had the Rome's protection. And therefore, they became hated by their own people. And especially amongst the Pharisees and scribes, the Pharisees and scribes would pray daily that God would purge the earth of publicans because they didn't believe a Messiah could walk on the same earth as traitors such as these. And so these were the scoundrels. They were not invited to family Sabbath. They were kicked out of their synagogues. They were not welcomed into the church, if you want to think of it that way. These are the publicans. And then sinners, we typically know what that word means. But in their context, especially the biblical authors, typically use that word to describe someone who was known for their sin. They were notorious sinners. And they were, they, they, these were the people that, that you look at them and, and, and instantly you know exactly what kind of lifestyle they live, exactly what kind of things they get into. Uh, they were the notorious sinners. Right? So you got the publicans and the sinners, and then you got the Pharisees and the scribes. And the Pharisee, it comes from the uh, Latin word parashim, which means separated ones. And they were separated from the Persian Empire originally, and now in this context, separated from the Roman Empire. And these men were dedicated to living out the text. They were dedicated to living out the law, but it went beyond that. It went beyond just the law. Uh, they wanted to live out the law so, so purely that they ended up making all these other laws to protect you from breaking the law. And pretty much their MO became, well, if we, if we can condemn you, we can control you. And so their message just basically became condemnation after condemnation after condemnation. And so the law would say, well, you don't work on the Sabbath, and they would define work. You don't walk on the Sabbath unless, unless a Pharisee needs to go on a walk. Uh, well, then you get 20 steps, or then you get 35 steps, or whatever the Pharisee put. And so they had all these extra things, and they used the scribes to do so. So the scribes are some of the only educated people, well, uh, I guess well-educated people amongst the Jews in the Roman Empire. They uh, could read, they could write, and they were responsible for honestly copying down a lot of the text that we have to be thankful for today. It's because of their work that we have a preserved copy of the scriptures. And yet these scribes became known for their interpretation of the text more than, their, more than the text itself. In fact, in things that follow Jesus' ministry, like the Talmud and things like the Mishnah, these things that really outlawed or outlined third century Judaism, uh, they say over and over again that where the scribes and the text disagree, we stand with the scribes' interpretation every time. Anytime you get somebody that says, my interpretation of the Bible is more important than the Bible itself, my friends, you got a red flag, all right? 
And yet these people have been invited to the same party that Jesus is hosting. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better place for any of these groups of people to be than right here eating with Jesus. Like, is it not a good thing that these publicans and sinners have drawn near to Christ to eat with them? These are people who are being transformed by the ministry of Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes show up, and they're not too happy about who else made the guest list. And they start murmuring and complaining outside. And Jesus hears their murmuring and complaining. The, this man receiveth sinners and publicans and eateth with them. This is, this is outrageous to them. How could this man who claims to be from God eat with such filth as these? And Jesus hears their complaining and he speaks a parable unto them in response. Now a parable was an earthly story that had heavenly meaning. It was a simple story that helped you un uh, 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 unlock complex truth. It, it, was an, it, was a, it was a story that was connected to earthly situations, but it helped you gain heaven's perspective on those situations. And Jesus loved parables. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13, it says that he went for such and such a time with speaking only in parables to his disciples. And yet around dinner tonight at Luke chapter 15, Jesus lays out one of his greatest hits. I think if you were compiling a record, you know, the Jesus and the parables, right? The, the greatest hits. I think Luke 15 is track number one. And he sits around a table that night and talks about lost sheep, lost coins, and lost sons. And he talks about the heartbreak of what it feels like to lose and the sweet joy and celebration that comes from finding. Yeah, my oldest son, he's seven, Mason, and... Uh, when he turned four, he kind of thought he owned the world, you know? You know how when your kid turns four, they just think, you know, they got life figured out. And so Mason turned four, and his grandparents bought him a bike for his birthday. I don't know why a four-year-old needs a bike, but he's got one, you know? And uh, he doesn't know how to ride it, but he's got this bike, you know? And, uh, and so we would take him out with the training wheels, and he would kind of go around on this bike around our little neighborhood there. We live in a little condo area there in Yuma, Arizona. And he liked to go out on that bike, but he would always want to go out without us, you know? And so we had to constantly tell him, no, 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 you got to wait till dinner's over. You got to wait till after lunch I, so that I can go with you, you know, and he's eating little Logan's real little at this time. And so he's getting kind of a lot of the, the intensive care and, and uh, you know, making sure we got eyes on him at all times. And I was coming home from work one night. It was on a Wednesday night and days of COVID. And so uh, I had to push the service through live stream that night. And so from my home computer, I'm pushing the service through live for our church to watch. And as soon as that service ended, I remember going downstairs and wanting to just kind of relax. It was one of those days at work where nothing went right and you just kind of couldn't wait to get home and just relax with your family, you know? And so, man, I come down the stairs and I pick up Logan. I kind of give him a big hug and we kind of make each other laugh a little bit. And I go over to my wife. I give her a hug. I say, hey, where's Mason? And she says, he went upstairs. He was looking for you. I said, really? I didn't see him upstairs. So I run back upstairs and I go into his room and I can't find him. I'm looking everywhere. He's not behind the curtains. He's not under his bed. He's not in the dresser drawer. You know, he's, he's nowhere. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I went downstairs and so he went into my room. And so I run across the hallway into my room and I'm looking under my bed and looking under my curtains and under my desk and in my closet and my dresser drawer. And uh, he's not there. So after I thought I had done an adequate job of searching upstairs, I walked back downstairs and said, hey, Lexa, are you sure he's upstairs? And my wife gave me the answer only wives can by saying, yes, I'm sure he's upstairs, you know. And she began to <coughs> march up the stairs as if she was going to do what I could not do and find him. Well, I started looking downstairs. I wanted to look under the sink and I wanted to look under the kitchen table and in the pantries and in the coat closet. At this point, I thought he was playing hide and seek with me. So now I'm calling his name. Hey, Mason, Mason, where are you at, buddy? Are you in the house? Where are you hiding? You win, you know? I go into the living room. I'm looking behind the curtains. I'm looking in the game drawer. I'm looking under the couch. I'm looking everywhere. I cannot find this kid. Well, sure enough, my wife comes down the stairs and she's whiter than I am. She looks like she's seen a ghost. And she says, uh, I don't think he's upstairs. I said, yeah, I know he's not upstairs. She says, I don't think he's downstairs. I said, yeah, I don't think he's downstairs either. She says, well, where is he? I said, I don't know, but you were in charge. This is on you, you know, like you lost our kids, you know. 
I thought, well, did, did he go out and ride his bike? You know, and so I checked the, the, the front yard. His bike's sitting right there. I checked the backyard. Gates are all locked. I'm looking out in this condo. The sun is setting. It's getting dark. I'm thinking, well, I've never lost a kid before. Don't really know how this all works. I don't know who to call, right? And so we start walking around the neighborhood, and I'm calling his name. Hey, Mason, where you at, buddy? Mason, Mason. My wife is evangelizing. She's knocking on the door. She's asking the neighbors, hey, have you seen our four-year-old little boy? Now, you got to understand, my son Mason, he doesn't, he doesn't know a stranger. Part of that's my fault. I take him to a bunch of random churches and say, go meet the strangers, right? So he doesn't know what a stranger is. He would gladly take candy from a big white van that pulled up because we live in a big white van, okay? And so that would not be out of the ordinary at all. And so I'm walking around this neighborhood and my heart's starting to panic. My legs are starting to shake. I can sense my wife is getting more and more nervous as the time passes. The sun is going down. And all I can think about are those pictures of the kids posted in Walmart that are lost. And I, I always walk past it and think what terrible parents they must have. Yeah, it's a little bit different when you're the terrible parent, right? And I remember going back inside, me and my wife, and we're just both sitting there. I'm looking at Logan and I'm like, well, one for two ain't bad, you know, like... This is not well. This is not good. And as I'm sitting there shaking, the world feels like it's crumbling, I notice over in the corner of the living room this uh, pile of blankets. Now, typically, they, those piles of blankets would be in a basket. But the basket was over here, empty, and the pile of blankets was on top of something. It was all covering something. And what I, what I soon discovered was this uh, Fisher Price picnic table that my mother-in-law had bought my kids, you know, for a, a birthday or something. Uh, probably just a random Tuesday, knowing grandparents, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so this is over in the corner. These blankets are all just covered up. Nothing looked out of the order. It looked like where the blankets were. And I remember looking at my wife and saying, what's that? And I don't know exactly what she said, but something to the effect of, oh, Mason, that was Mason's fort from earlier today, you know. I said, Mason's fort from earlier today? I mean, you've got to understand, I was walking around the house screaming his name, Mason, Mason. So I get up, and I am thinking, this kid better pray he's not under that table, right? <laughs> like, he'd be safer in a white van that was offering him candy at this point, right? And so I'm walking over this table, and I remove those blankets, and I remove that picnic table, and Mason is underneath sound asleep just entirely past it. Well, I can't really describe the feeling that overwhelmed me. My legs felt like they turned to jello. I just kind of went down on the ground. My arms wrapped around him. He's sweating profusely, right? I, I'm, I'm wrapping him in my arms. I'm, I'm saying, oh, Mason, Mason, he doesn't wake up. He's sleeping. He's snoring, you know, and I'm giving him kisses. And Logan comes over and joins the, the family hug. And my wife comes over and hugs us as well. I remember carrying him up the stairs and putting him into his bed and just laying next to him. I didn't want to leave his side for that night. Why? Because I had felt the heartbreak of what it felt like to lose. And then I felt the sweet relief and joy of what it was like to find and that's the emotion that Jesus is playing with in, these par in this parable. He, he wants you to feel that tension of what it's like to lose and what it's like to find. Now, you've probably noticed I'm not saying parables. I'm saying parable. And the reason I'm doing that is because verse 3 does that. He says, it spake this parable unto them. So while there are three stories in Luke 15, they are part of one parable that Jesus tells. And while we often associate these parables with the things that have been lost, the emphasis on the parable is actually on the one doing the finding. So it's not so much about a lost coin and lost sheep and lost sons as much as it is about a shepherd and a woman and a father who are passionately seeking after lost sheep, coins, and sons. And I'll tell you why that's significant. Because in the Psalms, God shows up pretty metaphorically a lot. He shows up as a strong tower and a mighty fortress. He shows up as the wings of an eagle. And over and over again in their hymn book, God is going to be showing up as these metaphoric, allegoric things. Well, three different times in the Psalms, God shows up metaphorically as like a, a person, as like flesh. He shows up as a shepherd in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in still pastures upon, or in green pastures amongst still 
water. He shows up as a, metaphorically again, as a woman in Psalms 131 who nurses her child to comfort when they are in distress. And then the Lord shows up again in Psalms uh, 103, verse number 13, as a father that has compassion upon his children, so shall the Father have, or so shall the Lord have compassion on all those that fear him. Well, these Pharisees and scribes, they know these passages. They know this text. And all three of those psalms are metaphors connected to the characteristic of gentleness and compassion. And so here we have God speaking this parable to these people who are murmuring outside, complaining that Jesus would eat with the publicans and sinners. And it's almost like Jesus uses these characters in his stories to say, yeah, you know everything there is to know about God, but you're missing something about him. You're missing his gentleness and compassion. You are missing his heart for sinners. You're missing his heart for the lost, dying world. These Pharisees, they love to point out the problems, but Jesus says they wouldn't lift one of their fingers to help. They love to be condescending about the world around them, but there was no compassion to lean in and do anything. And Jesus is going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees over and over again. Why? Because he said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so while we read these stories and we typically read them with hearts of like, wow, what a beautiful story. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing here. <laughs> Jesus is throwing punches at the Pharisees and scribes. He wants them to understand this is a big deal to God. Now, we do not have the time to look at all three of these stories tonight. And so we're going to go straight to the most popular of the three stories, that of the lost son or the prodigal son. Uh, at the very least, I think it should be called the story of the prodigal sons. Uh, but I think uh, a better case in general would be the story of the forgiving father. And so I want you to jump to this verse here and I want to read this story together and we'll stop along the way to kind of make sure we're catching details. So this is verse number 11 here. And look at what Jesus says. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he, the father, divided unto them his living. Now, we'll just acknowledge right off the bat, we've heard this story before, have we not? Yes, this is a very familiar, well-beloved story. In fact, Charles Dickens called this the greatest short story that had ever been told. This is a powerful story. This is a beautiful story. And at first read, or at any read, you're going to be moved by the story. It is designed and told that way. But I have discovered that when you take time, the appropriate time, to read it through the eyes of the first audience, as the first audience would have heard it from Jesus, uh, it doesn't just become a good story, it becomes a life-changing story. And I don't know about you, but I came here tonight because I believe Jesus wants to change some lives. I came here tonight because I believe the Spirit wants to make us new creatures and change us in, in a beautiful way. And so I want to take just a moment to make sure we understand some of the cultural things that would have definitely been understood by the first audience. Okay, so, so we live, th 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 this group of people live in a patriarchal society. And I know there's a bunch of talk about the patriarchy today in a negative sense, but all it means here is that the father of the household, he casts the vision and the mission for the household. So if, if the father had a calling to be a fisherman, well, then everybody in his house was called to be fishermen. That was the family purpose. And they might not all go out in a boat and cast nets. Some might make the nets. Some might run the family shop down in the marketplace where they sell the fish. But everybody is connected to the business of the father. And when that father passes, everything he owns, everything he has, everything he works for, his responsibility, his authority, everything gets divided amongst his living sons. And so in the case of this story, a man's got two sons. And so when he passes, his entire life will be divided into three equal parts. You say, why three parts? He only has got two sons. Well, because the firstborn was known as the Bahor. He was the elder son, and he was going to receive a double portion of the blessing. Not just of the goods, but also of the workload and the responsibility 
he was going to have a double portion of, of, of the work, right? And so this was an honorable thing to be known as the firstborn son. And so notice what the, the younger son does here. He comes to his father and he tells him, he says to him, Father, give me the portion of goods. Now, see, he doesn't say give me the inheritance. <laughs> he says you can keep the work stuff, you can keep the authority stuff, you can keep the responsibility. Just give me the good stuff that comes to me when you die. This is the ancient Near Eastern way of wishing your father was dead. Now, this is grounds for death in the Old Testament. Again, in Jesus' day, they weren't killing kids, but they were casting them out because you were allowed to leave the batav, the, the family house, but you weren't allowed to take anything with you, right? And so you could go follow a rabbi, but you weren't going to get anything from the family. And so this boy wants goods passed down to him so that he can go and do his thing, live outside of the family mission. And so everybody in the audience would have been shaking their head like, who does this kid think he is? And that's why it's just puzzling that Jesus says, and so the man divided unto them his living. Like he just does it. And the assumption from the audience would be that this father is not very smart. <laughs> this father doesn't know what he's doing. This father should have publicly shamed him. This father should have kicked him out. The, 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 this father should have took everything away from him and, and made him regret what he said. But that's not what the father does. And from then on out, Jesus is going to tell this story in a way that makes you absolutely disgusted with the younger son. And he does a great job with it. Look at what it says. It says, and so not many days after this, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Now, the far country is most likely a reference to the Decapolis, the region that was directly across the sea from the Sea of Galilee. You could see across it, and you could see the smokestacks coming from the pagan temples in the Decapolis. The Decapolis was a, a region made up of ten Gentile cities, entirely pagan in nature. And the Pharisees and scribes had forbidden you go to the Decapolis. They they had forbidden you even think about the Decapolis, and so they had actually even forbidden you even to say the name Decapolis. It was the city that shall not be named, right? It was uh, the far country. It was the other side of the sea. And so Jesus says this kid took his living, and he went to the far country. And what does he do? He wasted his substance with riotous living. Well, of course, that's what this rebellious kid does. Of course, he would go there. Of course, he would waste his substance there. There's nothing to do there but waste your substance. This is the equivalent of a kid taking his life savings and blowing it in Vegas. And everyone says, well, of course, that's what the young kid went and did. He wasted it on riotous living. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And all the Pharisees and scribes say, good. And he went, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. Oh, my goodness. And he sent him to the fields to feed swine. Now, you don't got to be a Jew to know that they don't get to eat the bacon that we'd get to eat. No, pigs are unclean animals. They are filthy animals. And what a perfect place for the filthy kid to end up with the filthy pigs. This is a perfect place for the unclean kid to wind up. And then Jesus twists the knife in. He says, and he would have feigned, have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And if you listen carefully, you can hear a Pharisee cry, Hey, man! Yeah! That's exactly where that kid belongs. Good! He's in the pig pen. He's starving. Nobody wants to give him any food. Jesus, I like this story. Slow clap. Wow. Let's have an invitation. Woo! The Pharisee and scribe is loving this story. But we know how the story goes. He has this come to his senses moment. It says in the next verse, and when he came to himself, he said, 
How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and yet I perish with hunger? So this is the scene. He's sitting there in the pig pen. He's feeding them the slobs that they eat, and he's looking at it, and he is starving. He's licking his lips a little bit. Oh, I think I want to eat some of that. He goes, wait a second. What, what, what am I doing? I'm over here less than after big food when my father's got plenty of bread. My father's got plenty of food. His servants don't go hungry like this. His servants have all the food in the world. He says, man, what am I doing? So he concocts this plan. He says, I will arise. I'll get out of this pig pen. I'll go back to my father and I'll say unto him, Father, I have sinned before heaven and, the, and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. He's thinking, I don't need to be a son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Like, listen, I might not like you, dad, but at least put me to work. At least, at least give me the punishment I deserve. Go, go make me work as a servant in the field. That way, at least I've got some food to eat. And so he's got this plan. And then he puts that plan in motion. It says, and he arose and he came unto his father. Now, for those of us that have heard this story before, we start cheering at this part. We're like, yes, go home, buddy. Go back home. The father's waiting for you. Go back to the father. The father loves you. The father's got food for you. Go back to the father. But did you know the first century audience that hears Jesus tell this story? That is not how they're responding at all. They're sitting there going, don't go back to the father. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think this kid knows how life works. You see, when a kid was sent out of the family Bataf, when he chose not to carry on the mission, they had a funeral for him. They marked his grave. They sat Shiva seven days and mourned his death. And then they went on with their lives. And so dead men don't live again. And so if the son would ever come back, well, they were put to death by the guards outside the camp and buried outside the batav. In fact, you can go to Israel today. They'll take you on several batavs or kibbits or whatever you want to refer to them as, these houses or these, these villages. And you can go into the family batav and they'll show you the family graveyard. And they'll tell you, there are graves here that are marked, but there were no bodies in. Then they'll take you outside the batav. And they'll say, here's the graveyard they didn't want you to know about. This is the one where there's bodies, but no markings. And they said this would happen on a regular basis. That a kid would leave, he would regret his decision, he would come home, and he'd be put to death outside the camp. Because dead men don't live again. And so everyone in the audience is sitting there going, you don't go back to the father. You think this father is going to forgive you? You think this father is going to let you be a servant? This father's not talking to you. No, no. In fact, I guarantee you there's some publicans sitting there going, yeah, I tried that. I had to run for my life as stones were being hurled at me. You can't go back to the father's house. And that's what makes the next part of this story that much more beautiful, my friends. For the Bible says that as he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you he was looking. He saw him. And he was moved with compassion that he ran. Now, that might not seem significant, but old men don't run. You want to know why? Just watch Pastor Luke run. It's not pretty, all right? No, no, no. Oh, old men don't run. That was undignified. That was something for children. No, no. But this man doesn't care about his dignity. He doesn't care about his reputation. He is going to run because he cares for his son. And look what he does. He fell upon his neck and he kissed him. My friends, these are signs of restoration. 
These are signs of welcoming you home into the family. This is not some story about a father who lost his son and then finds him. He has no idea where he's at, and he finds him underneath a picnic table in his own living room. No, no, This is a story about a father who loses his son, and he knows exactly where he's at. He knows exactly what kind of life he's been living. He knows exactly what kind of filth he's gotten himself into. He knows exactly the kind of mess and baggage that he has built up, and he, yet even still, he gets up every morning. He sits on the rocking chair on his front porch and he looks out towards the road to Decapolis and he waits there and he longs there and he hopes there and you know he prays there for his son to return home and he sits there day in, day out, night after night, morning after morning. The servants come and try to bring him some food but he won't eat. He can't eat. He fills the empty stomach his son has. He says it could be any day now and his wife tries to get him to come in and get some rest get some good sleep you can come back out in the morning but he can't sleep no 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 I can't sleep what if my son comes home in the middle of the night and the guards go out and take his life I've got to be here when he comes home and he sees him when he's a great way off I guarantee you he even smelled him when he was yet a great way off and what does he do he hikes up that gown and he he runs to his son and he falls upon him. Notice, he doesn't say spray him down with a hose first. No, no, no. He doesn't say, hey, let's get him some new clothes and then I'll hug him. Then I'll embrace him. Then I'll kiss him. He doesn't even let him give his speech yet. No, no, no. His first response is love. His first response is compassion. His first response is to give him a kiss. His first response is to show him you are still loved. And then what happens? Well, the son starts to go through his speech, does he not? He says, uh, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But he doesn't get the next, verse, the, the, he doesn't get the next part out, does he? No, no, no. He doesn't get to say, make me one of thy hired servants. Nope. The father cuts him off. It's like the father hears him say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father goes, well, that ain't true. You don't earn sonship. You don't become worthy of being a son. You are my son. And so what does he do? He says, no, 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 no. He says, uh, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Well, whose robe do you think was the best robe in the house? Yeah, that's the father's robe. He says, put my robe on him. He says, put a ring on his hand. What, what, what ring do you think that was? That's the family seal. That's the family signet ring. He says, put shoes on his feet. Well, shoes were reserved for sons, not slaves. And then he says, bring forth the fatted calf that we might eat and make merry. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. He says, we're having a feast tonight. You know how many people can eat off a fatted calf? About 200 to 300 people. This is a block party. They're having a massive celebration. Can you imagine all the servants running around knocking on doors? They're going, hey, remember Johnny? We had a funeral for him a couple weeks ago. He's alive. He's alive. He's back. We're having ribs tonight. Come on over. Hey, hey, have you heard about Johnny? Yeah, the one that died a couple. Yeah, yeah. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. We're eating good tonight. The Father's ordered ribs for everyone. He put shoes on his feet. He put his robe on his back. He put a ring on his finger. Hey, we're having ribs tonight. Dead men live again. And they began to make merry, the Bible says. And it's like a perfect ending. If you read the first two stories, that's how they ended. Something was lost, it's found, celebration. Something's lost, it's found, celebration. The son was lost, he's found, celebration. You know how it ends. And they all lived happily ever after. That's not how Jesus ends it. What does Jesus say next? Jesus says, now. That's his way of saying, meanwhile, right? Yeah, you know Jesus was a Baptist because he always had a third point hanging in there somewhere, right? There was always something else to say. And he says, now the, young, now the elder son, 
And Jesus brings us back to a detail that he inserted at the beginning of the story when he said a certain man had two sons. And so now he's bringing you back. He's saying, oh, yeah, that's right. The, the man had two sons. So what happened to the elder son? What happened to the Bahor of the family? Well, the elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked, we are Baptists. Why is there music and dancing going on in the house? Are the getches in town with their boys? Like, what is going on? He says, what meaneth these things? Verse 27. And the servant, this is the servant, he said unto him, Thy brother is come. Thy father hath killed a fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. So he's absent and angry from the party. So what's going to happen? Well, therefore came his father out and entreated him. Man, I want to get to the last few verses here, but we got to spend just a second on this verse. Because the father was just as willing to run out the back door as he was willing to run out the front door. You know what I'm saying? He, he was just as willing to chase down the elder son as he was to chase down the younger son. See, sometimes I think we think of the story like one's lost, one's saved, and, and this is the problem. One's just carnal. No, no, both sons are lost. Both sons have no clue what it's like to be part of a family. Both sons don't know relationship with the father. And so the father is chasing after the younger son, but he's also willing to chase after the elder son as well. And he comes out, and the Bible says he entreated him. This word entreated, it's the Greek word paraclete, and it shows up a lot of times in the New Testament. In fact, it's one of the most versatile Greek words you're going to find. It has 17 different English translations in your King James Bible there. It's translated as beseech, and edify, and encourage, and, and beg, and, and, and plead, and, and come alongside of. It's going to be translated all over the place, but perhaps the most necessary th c c component is that when John uses this word in his gospel, he uses it in its noun format to describe the Holy Spirit, the comforter that will come, the paraclete. And if you were to parse it out, it means that he came alongside of him or he, he put his arm around him and he's trying to do all these things. So the father is now coming alongside of his elder son and he is being the role of the Holy Spirit in his elder son. And he's trying to encourage him. He's trying to beg him. He's trying to beseech him. He's trying to get to the point. Why are you absent and angry from this party we're having? Why are you not celebrating what everybody else is celebrating? What's going on? on. You've got to come in. You've got to celebrate with us. And look at how the elder brother answers the Holy Spirit in his life. It says, and he answering said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Picture it. The father leaves the party, puts his arm around his boy, says, what's going on? Didn't you hear? We're having a celebration. Come join the celebration. Your brother's back. Come on. And the guy just loses his cool. He says, you want me to go into that house and celebrate with you? Absolutely not. No way, no how am I ever going into that house right now. You have got to be out of your mind. I have been working. I have been striving in the field day in, day out, working my hands to the bone for you. I've been doing all this work. Me and my friends, we never miss a day. We never show up late. We've always got the right dress coat on. We're always in the right place. We're always doing all the right things. And you've never once, never once have you said, well, we're going to throw a little party for you. Take a goat. Take a little goat. Have it. You and your friends, you deserve it. You've been working so hard. No, you've never done that. Never once have you ever poured me a glass of sweet tea. No. No. But as soon, oh, oh, as soon as your little boy came back, oh, he starts coming back. And you're like, oh, oh, he's back. Oh, oh, oh. 
and you kill for him. A fed and ca- he's wasted your living. He's ruined your reputation. He's done all the wrong things. And he gets a celebration, and now you're like, hey, come and try. No! I'm not doing it. And all of us are just kind of like, awkward. (laughs) What is going on here? Like, how many of you feel like you're just listening to a conversation you shouldn't be listening to? (laughs) Like, what in the world? I think the Bible's writing the quiet part out loud here. And look what the father says to his son. I'm telling you, these next two verses have convicted me in my tracks time and time again. It says, and he said unto him, son. He calls him son. (laughs) He reminds him who he is. He says, son, you are ever with me. And all that I have is thine. He's saying, listen, I'm sorry you felt like you had to earn your party, but you don't. You don't have to work for it. You want a goat? It's yours, man. Take the goat. It's almost like he's reminding him. You you realize how this works, right? He took his half. Everything else is yours. You're my son. You are always going to be my son. You want to go? Go get a go. Go celebrate with your friends. But listen, it was meat, he says. It was necessary. It was vitally important. It was of the utmost imperative that we should make merry and be glad. Now watch this. He reminded him who he was, but now he's going to remind him who his brother is. Notice when he said, he said, thy son has come. Now look what the father does. He says, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and he is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. He says, son, you can have your party anytime you want. Go get the goat. Send the invites out. But let let me tell you something. It is imperative that we walk into that house right now and celebrate. Because we are a family that believes in resurrections. We are a family that celebrates new life. And when your brother came home, hey, your brother's in there. He's alive. He's home. It is our responsibility. It is our mission. It is our calling to welcome dead men back to life. And we're just kind of left here at the end of Luke 15. Like, Why'd you tell that part? Right? Why, why did you tell the part about the elder brother? It was so much better when you ended it with the they began to make Mary part. Like they all lived happily ever after. Why don't you end the story there? In fact, Jesus, if you're preaching this again, maybe leave off the elder brother part. That was kind of a downer. That kind of sucked the energy out of the room. So ask yourself, th- these are important questions. Don't just ask, uh, uh, what, like, what is the story or those kind of questions. Ask, why did they record this part of the story? Why was this part of the story said? Why did this part of the story rem- be remembered and passed down for all of these years? Well, obviously, the, the big answer there is because the Lord wanted it to. But, but I think the, the answer really shows us some truth here. Why did Jesus tell the part of the elder brother? Well, he kind of had to. Because remember why he's telling this story in the first place. He's invited publicans and sinners to eat with him along with Pharisees and scribes. And the publicans and sinners are inside. This is a celebration in God's eyes. And the, public, and the Pharisees and scribes are outside refusing to come in. <laughs> They're absent and they're murmuring, they're complaining, they're angry outside. So Jesus is telling these stories to convince them that, hey, you're in the wrong. 
You need to come in and celebrate. So he tells a story about a, lost she- uh, uh, about, about a lost sheep. And if you were a shepherd who lost a sheep, you'd go out and find it. That's the whole point of the story. That's what good shepherds do. So he's accusing the Pharisees and scribes of being bad shepherds. Then he tells a story about a coin that's lost and a woman searches all day for it. Well, these coins were part of her wedding garments. And if she had lost one of those coins, it was grounds for divorce and death, public shaming. Like the point of the story is she has to find the coin. And Jesus is relating it and saying, you've lost a part of what makes you mine, and you don't care about it. (laughs) You're, you're, You're actually quite glad it's gone. Again, he's accusing them of missing the point. They need to come inside and celebrate the lost being found. Well, now he tells the story. The younger brother is clearly the publican and sinner. They've come home. There's a celebration going on. And the point is, The elder brother is supposed to come in and celebrate. But they already understand that point long before Jesus makes it at the end of Luke 15. Because they've heard this story before. In fact, this story is part of their history book. Yeah. Remember a man in the Old Testament that had two sons? His name was Isaac. His younger son's name was Jacob. And then Esau was the elder son. In fact, the the Jacob figure, the, the younger son, he actually gets the double portion of that blessing, does he not? He steals it right from his brother at, at, at his father's blind. And he put on the goat hair to look like Esau, right? We all love that story. And then he goes out and he wastes his life, does he not? He spoils it. He makes a huge mess of God's calling in his life. And then in Genesis this is chapter 32. He's coming back home because he's gotten a world of trouble. He can't go back to Laban. He really can't come back home because Esau is still trying to kill him. And so he finds himself in the middle of the nowhere and he wrestles with the angel of the Lord and it changes his life. And in chapter 33 of the book of Genesis, Jacob comes back home. And do you know who comes out to greet him? Amen. Yeah, Esau the elder brother. You remember what Esau does? <laughs> Would you mind if I just read a little bit from Genesis chapter 30? It doesn't matter. I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> Genesis chapter 33. You don't have to turn there. This is Genesis chapter 33. It says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. He divides his children unto the handmaids and unto his wives. And verse number 3, it says, And he passed over before them. So Jacob comes before all of his family. He bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. This is Genesis 33, verse number 4. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. My friends, that's about as word perfect as you're going to get to what the father does to the son in Luke chapter 15. And so the Pharisees and scribes, they know the story. And they hear about how Jacob is now coming home. And they hear about the father coming out to greet him. And they start wondering who Jesus' history teacher was. They're sitting there going, no, it wasn't Isaac that greets his son. Esau went out and greeted him. Where's Esau? And they know, yeah, we're the Esau figure. We get it. Where are we? (laughs) Why aren't we the ones that went out and greeted the younger brother? Where is Esau? Esau. Well, you want to know where Esau is? He's absent and angry in the field, throwing a temper tantrum because things aren't being done his way exactly as he wants because God's showing mercy on the younger brother. It's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, you want to know why I'm here? You want to complain about why I'm here? Well, guess what? I'm here because you're not doing your job. You're not doing the role of Esau. Even Esau. Think about that. Even Esau, the one that became the father of the Edomites, the one that became the sworn enemy of Israel, even Esau knew how to welcome his brother home. Even Esau knew how to wrap somebody in love and compassion. Even Esau understood what it meant to be part of a family and how that meant that when someone that was dead gets back up and comes home, you embrace them. Even Esau had that figured out, Pharisee and scribe. Why can't you figure it out? Whoa. This has massive implications for the Pharisee and scribe in Jesus' day. But I think it's got some massive implications for us today as well. Why is the church so divided today? Why is it that we expect our brothers to be twins? Why is it that we would rather settle for goat than fatted calf. 
I'm telling you, the party Jesus is throwing is much better than the party we're throwing. Our party stinks. Our party's boring. Our party's got no joy. You know why? Because it's all about who's out there. Let's make sure that person's out there. Uh, don't get too close to them. Ah, yeah. Well, you know him. You know what he did. Well, yeah, you know that. No, no, no. Where are the people who, instead of talking about people, will go love people? Who <laughs> will go wrap their arms around some people? Will go love people? Remember when Jesus and his, and his sons of thunder are walking by Samaria and the brothers are like, hey, Lord, let's call down some thunder. Let's wipe these people off the map. And Jesus is like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> we do not actively pray for the annihilation of another group of people. Amen. That's not what we do. <laughs> We're going to love people. There's a woman at a well down there I'm going to go talk to. There's a woman that needs some love and compassion. There's some women who need to, there's some people out in the world today that need us to be less concerned about our reputation and our dignity and more concerned with their livelihood and more concerned that they exist. Why is it that we view people as people instead of souls? Why is it that, that we look at someone based on the color of their skin or the clothes on their back or their status in life and, and, and judge <laughs> And show partiality to some over others instead of just seeing people as created in the image of God. Just like me. Just like you. Why can't we go out and see the, the world and see a bunch of graves that the Spirit of God is wanting us to go rob? Go wake some souls up. There's, a, there's life Dead men live again. That's the mission of the church, to go tell the world that dead men can live again. And don't you just love how Luke chapter 15 ends? Oh, man. The younger brother looks at his father. He goes, oh, dad. Dad, I am so sorry, dad. Dad. Come here, dad. Come on, dad. Let's go inside. Let's go party. <laughs> Come on, Dad. Let's get younger brother. Let's go get younger brother. He's over here. Younger brother. Younger brother. You've got my hair cut. You're going to live with me. <laughs> younger brother. Come on. Oh. And they go back into the house. And they eat some ribs. They would probably order some Chick-fil-A. Oh, yes. They go inside. There was music. There was some dancing going on. Oh, <laughs> doesn't this just feel right? Yeah. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> That's how it ends, right? No. By the way, how, how does it end? Yeah, it just kind of doesn't, does it? He says, it was meet that we should make Mary and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he was found. And then the credits roll. <laughs> Black screen. Highlights of Michael Jordan start popping up like there's nothing next. That's it. What happened? Did the elder brother repent and come inside and party? What about the younger brother? Was he like really sorry? Was he really repentant? Did he actually learn his lesson? And what about the father? What happened to this guy? He had already divided up his living. Now he's still alive and both his sons are still living as well. Like, this is kind of really wild, isn't it? What happened? We don't know. Jesus lets it linger. And I'm here to tell you tonight, we get to decide how it ends. Thank you, good. Thank you. Thank you, family. Strangest family I've ever been a part of. <laughs> Jesus tells this story, and in my mind, he finishes the story. He sits down at that table. And he puts his arm around Matthew, a publican who had come to follow him. Then he looks over and he slices a, a piece of bread off the loaf and puts it on a plate and serves it to Mary Magdalene, a sinner 
who had come to follow Jesus. And then I can picture Jesus looking out that front door at those Pharisees and scribes with their arms crossed, murmuring outside, and I can see him motion to the empty seats he's got set at the table. As if to say, you gonna join us? You gonna join the celebration? My arms are open. Why are your arms crossed? We're celebrating. Why are you condemning? Come on in. Let's be a part of the mission of the Father to love and forgive and be people who welcome the lost home. Amen. Dead men can live again. You say, you seem pretty confident in that. Why? Because I believe in a Savior who rose from the dead. Amen. And He was the first fruits of those of us that remain. And we that were dead in our trespasses and sins are now made alive through the Spirit of God. Amen. Hey folks, dead men do live again. And if you want to know, why, if you want to know how I know that, it's because I'm one of them. Amen. And I am so thankful that he opened the door and asked me to sit at the table and eat. And now I believe it's my mission. It's, it's what he's called me to, to go welcome sinners home, to go out in the dark of, of the night and point them to the one who can give new life. Lord, we thank you tonight that you raise the dead. Father, we thank you tonight that you are still calling sinners home. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to show us how to love people. Father, may, may our mission not be about us. May you help us tonight see souls, see, see image bearers of God. Would you help us tonight? Would you direct our feet, direct our hands, direct our eyes to see people as those who need to be made alive. And may you give us the compassion of the Father. Father, I think so many times we look at the story and, and maybe we see uh, us as the younger son and may, or maybe we, we have a, a prodigal that, 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 that instantly comes to mind and maybe we, we, we can even see our tendency to be like the elder brother. But Lord, I really think this, this story is trying to draw our attention on our need to be more like the father. You're calling us to be like that father that sits on that porch and looks and longs and hopes and prays you want us to be like that woman that, that's willing to search day and night and like that shepherd who will go to the highways and the hedges to find the lost sheep. Would you create in us a heart like Jesus's? Would you help us? Would you help us join in the celebration that dead men can live again? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed tonight. I'll ask the piano to begin to play softly. As the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, I ask you to respond tonight. So let's stand to our feet and let's just do it. Let's just respond. I want to live and love like the Father. I want to live and love like the Father. I want to see people as people who walk in the image of God. I want to see people as souls that are dying and on their way to hell. I want to join in the celebration that dead men can live again. May we join in the celebration tonight. As your bad eyes are closed, people are praying. There's time for you. This is an invitation time. Then pastor will come and he'll close the service as the Holy Spirit leads him.